And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. You have entered into Virtual Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. It's great to be with you today. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Kicking off a brand new broadcast week here in the Midwest Command Center. And uh, got a fantastic show in store for us. Uh, as you know, this uh, this uh, radio show doesn't have a lot of fluff. We, we don't do a lot of... Uh, ancillary things it's all meat and potatoes apologetics when it comes to uh the dojo here folks and we're so we're going to dive in deep we're going to start off with the week on the right foot and we're going to have our good friend william albrecht back on the show and as you know william last few times he's been on the show we've been working through christology looking at the uh some of the most central beliefs as catholics about who jesus is what jesus is And uh, we've gone over an awful lot of material so far in that series, uh, diving into Old Testament scriptures, New Testament scriptures, and of course the Apostolic Fathers, the later fathers, and we're getting into the councils. And uh, so I think it's great that we worked out where um, we're at this point in our series with William that we start going to the councils because it is Lent. And uh, it's important for us to know the background behind the creeds that we recite as Catholics. And I think whenever you're able to marry um, uh, your faith life and practice with your studying of uh, defending and explaining the faith, I think that is a double bonus because it improves you as a Christian, as a Catholic, and it also improves you as an instrument that God can use to defend and explain his faith. So um, William Albrecht will be joining us on the other side of the break. We're going to dive into Christology, and I think we're going to be focusing mostly on councils now. Um, On this side of the break, we're going to do what we always do here, folks. Um, As you know, uh, we sharpen our critical thinking skills with our Finding the Fallacy segment. In the segment, we look at informal fallacies and basically just wrong ways of thinking or defective ways of thinking. Today's finding the fallacy is the appeal to authority. And we also meet an early church father. Today's early church father actually isn't so much an individual church father as a group of fathers. And specifically, St. Cyprian of Carthage and the Acts of the Seventh Council of Carthage. Very controversial uh, point in church history in terms of doctrine and doctrine and and, uh, the struggle of papacy and the bishops. We'll learn a little bit more about that coming up in a few moments. But before we do that, I want to welcome all of you to the show. So welcome aboard, everybody. All of you listening on radio around the country. And, of course, our live stream peeps. Howdy. And as you know, this program is live streamed on social media, and it's also put out there on podcast in various distribution centers. So I want to welcome all of you podcast peeps in the future and around the world, which is really exciting because uh, it's amazing the reach that you can have now with the Internet. And uh, I get emails from all over the world from people who are listening to this program on podcast. So it's, it's great that you're with us and enjoying the show. Um, Also, um, by the way, talking about the show and podcasts and all that other stuff, definitely want to utilize a very important tool on the Internet, which is the virginmostpowerfulradio.org website. Every episode, I always point to this because I think it's an incredibly valuable tool because uh, right there on virginmostpowerfulradio.org, you can access all the shows that Virgin Most Powerful produces, including hands-on apologetics. So perhaps you can't listen to William or there's distractions, you're missing things, or maybe even you're taking notes. 
Never fear. All you have to do is just go to virtualmostpowerfulradio.org, click on Hands On Apologetics, and, and this program will be up shortly on the website. Uh, the uh, the people there are very diligent in doing that. And uh, that way you can listen to the show at your leisure. You can listen to certain sections over and over. You can take notes. You can share it with friends. You can download it. Do all sorts of stuff. You can also, by the way, use the search engine and look up all the other times William has been on the show, William Albrecht. And uh, you, that way you can listen to the whole series on Christology right there on virginmostpowerfulradio.org. So it, it's very, very powerful uh, tool for education and for evangelism and just spreading the word about the show. And by the way, I want to thank all of you who have spread the word and grown this audience. We've grown by leaps and bounds over the past couple of years that I've been doing hands-on apologetics, and that's all thanks to you. So thank you very much, everyone. Also, as always, i got to give the Dojo Mailbox, the official email. If you ever want to get a hold of me, this is the way to do it, folks. It is at questions at handsonapologetics.com. Let me repeat that. Questions at handsonapologetics.com comes directly to me. And I do try to answer them. Been behind. I think I'm starting to catch up. So so slowly but surely, I'm chipping away. Uh, man, it's amazing how uh, being out a couple of days with illness um, can really put you behind the, the uh, all these things. So I am getting there, folks. And uh, so thank you for your patience in waiting for my reply. Um, yeah, I, it's weird. You know, on the Internet, I, I get emails from all sorts of places that I don't remember ever setting up an email uh, portal. So that, that always worries me because I, I wonder whether or not there are some fraudulent ones out there that uh, maybe people are emailing me and they just never get to me. So uh, yeah, that's the way you do it. You do it through the official Dojo mailbox. Okay, I think that's pretty much it. So why don't we start by sharpening our critical thinking skills, shall we? And let's look at today's Finding the Fallacy. Like I said, today's Finding the Fallacy is the appeal to authority. And the appeal to authority fallacy, excuse me, fallacy is a logical fallacy of saying a claim is true simply because an authoritative figure um, made it. Um, the authority, authority figure could be anyone, an instructor, a politician, well-known academic, an author, um, or even an individual with experience related to the subject's claim. And, uh, yeah, so this is actually um, one of those cases where logicians kind of debate whether or not it truly is a fallacy or, or maybe there's certain conditions where it could be fallacious. Um, for example, uh, appeal to authority could be fallacious if uh, the authority isn't shared by both parties. I know some people have argued that if... Uh, both parties uh, believe that a particular individual is an expert and worthy of belief on a particular subject that you could lawfully or illicitly, I should say, um, um, you know, use that authority as part of evidence. But generally speaking, uh, not so. Um, now, we have to make a distinction, too, because the appeal to authority, some people say, well, isn't citing the early church fathers, isn't that an appeal to authority? And the the thing is, is that here you're, you're citing an authority as part of evidence that their own competency is the reason why you believe what their claim is true. However, when we cite the early church fathers, we're not doing that. Instead, when we cite the early church fathers, what we're doing is we're appealing to them as witnesses of the beliefs that circulated during their time, which is an entirely different thing. Um, it, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do history if, if you couldn't cite people as, uh, you know, evidence of a particular belief existing in a particular time. So very, very different things, folks. So just keep that in mind um, next time you run into today's Finding the Fallacy, which is the appeal to authority. All right. Well, let's meet our early church father for today. Uh, like I said, you know, early church fathers, they it's a mixed bag, folks. It, some Many, many times it's an individual father. Sometimes it's a group of fathers, like in council. 
as in today's ex, uh, episode. Sometimes it's an unknown document. Sometimes it's an epigram or an epitaph or something like that. Um, and basically, like I said, with church fathers, we're looking for eyewitnesses to the existence of certain beliefs at particular times. Well, today's early church father, like I says, the acts of the seventh council of Carthage presided over by St. Cyprian of Carthage. Um, so, uh, we're actually looking at a group of, uh, bishops in North Africa. And of course, this is a local council. It's not an ecumenical council. Carthage in North Africa, by the way, has uh, had many, many local councils. The Seventh Council of Carthage, of which Cyprian was president, met with 87 bishops present in the year 256 AD. The subject of their meeting was the now hotly controverted question of the baptism of heretics. They refused to acquiesce to the demands of Pope St. Stephen, even in the face of threats of excommunication, Emissaries were sent to Rome from the council, but Stephen refused to even give an, an audience. So let me give you a real quick background on it. Basically, uh, North African bishops had a custom, you could say a small tea tradition, of uh, rebaptizing uh, Christians who fell into heresy and repented. So uh, that particular custom in North Africa was not shared throughout the Universal Church. Uh, which believe that once you're baptized, you're always baptized. And in order to be readmitted to the church, you simply need to go to confession. And uh, Cyprian and the bishops felt otherwise, even in the teeth of Pope St. Stephen, who claimed that he cannot be baptized. And that's our early church father for today, the Acts of the Southern Council of Carthage. Coming up next, William Albrecht. Stay tuned. My mom's gonna have a baby. She is? Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is gonna be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Marianne Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America. Terry Barber here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I'm encouraging people to support realestateforlife.org. They'll have a pro-life agent for you. California's laws for the family are really bad. If you have a young family and you can afford to get out of California, get out and make a new life somewhere where you're not going to have the repressive laws. For example, if your son wants to change his sex and you don't want that to happen, the school can take your child away from you. Yes, that's how bad it is, folks. That's why I'm encouraging you to go to realestateforlife.org. God bless you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-On Apologetics 
And we're going to touch ground zero of the faith in terms of doctrine, and that is Christology. Uh, Christology, the study of Jesus, who Jesus is, what Jesus is. Is he a divine person? Is he a divine and human person? You know, those type of questions, all part of the discussion of understanding clearly who and what Jesus is. And uh, we have a good friend, William Albrecht, with us. William, as you know, has been on the show. We've been doing a continuing series on Christology, looking at the Old Testament all the way through the councils. William is a uh, fantastic apologist in his own right. He's participated in over 50 live and moderated debates, all sorts of different perspectives. Uh, He's a co-author of several uh, very good apologetic works on the Eucharist and Mary and so on. And this latest one, by the way, is on the papacy. You need to check it out if you if you don't have it. Um, also, William is the purveyor of patristicpillars.com, uh, which is a really, really cool um, uh, website where you can get uh, early church fathers, things like that. Um, and also uh, stay abreast of all, all the other great stuff that William does. Um, so any, I just heard uh, <laughs> handy uh engineer richard uh telling me that we're we're having trouble getting in contact with william so while we're trying to get william on the uh, program uh i guess i could lay down some of the recap some of the important things of christology um in terms of who and what jesus is for example um the person of christ you know is Jesus a human person? Is he a divine person? Is he two persons, a divine and a human person? Uh, this is a question that when I do parish seminars and uh, throw this question out, I would probably say a good majority, perhaps 60% or more people, good Catholics, get this wrong, you know? Uh, because we know we think of Jesus as true God and true man, and he is, right? But... That's in terms of his nature, um, but not in terms of his person. So, um, <laughs> so Jesus is uh, a single person, and he's a divine person, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. So, uh, Jesus is one divine person, not not a divine and a human person, but he has two natures. He possesses the totality of the one undivided divine nature. Um, with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And he also has a full and complete and total human nature that he assumed to himself in the incarnation. So he has two natures, divine and human. He's one divine person. And that's very important because the person is the agent of action. So since uh, Jesus is a divine person, our salvation is brought about by God himself, the second person of the Trinity. Very good. And, uh, and of course, nature is the capacities, you know, how or, or what capacities a person has. So being divine, he could do all divine things. And being human, he can do things that are specifically human. And I, I hear from Richard that we have our guest on the uh, on the phone. So William Albrecht, welcome to back to Hands-On Apologetics. Hey, Gary, thanks for having me. A little bit of a uh... Gremlins in the modem, so restarting the modem. So God willing, on the other side of the break, people will see. I will get to see my face, but but for now, glad to be back with you, brother. Glad to be able to talk Christology again. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's it's that's what makes live radio fun. You never know what's going to happen <laughs> next. It, it seems hey, on this show that happens a lot. Call in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, Without a doubt, and and you were talking about how vitally important, really, the understanding who of who Christ is, Gary, and you know it's been such a blast going through the Old Testament, going through the New Testament, and then going through the Christological councils. We heard from the Council of Nicaea, we heard about Arius, and we heard about the forerunner to Arius, Paul of Samosata, and, and earlier today, this morning, I was thinking how you brought up the last time we spoke a really interesting point that the majority of people, when they think of the Eucharistic controversies, the first person that will come to their mind is Barry Garth Forrest, 
without realizing that there was a forerunner to his period of time as well, that being the figure of Nestorius. And particularly when we think of Berengarius, we think of figures like Retramnes and, and various others. But before that, you get Nestorius, who in essence denied Christol denied proper Christology. And as we've talked about it before, if you have a poor understanding of Eucharistic theology, you're going to have a poor understanding of Christology. And Nestorius, leading up to the controversy at the Council of Nicaea in the 5th century, was denying that it was proper to call Mary the mother of God, the God-bearer, the title Theotokos, because he was denying key aspects and key tenets of Christology. Gary, isn't it amazing how everything truly really is interconnected? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I have to give my my hat tip to you, William, because it was reading uh, your work on transubstantiation that really hit home. You know, I always, like it said, uh, you know, just casual reading, you get the, the impression that the first person to ever contest the real presence was Berengarius in the you know turn of the first millennium. But uh, you you really opened my eyes to see that no, this is something that actually goes all the way back to Nestorian of all people. Yes, without a doubt. And it's really, if you stop and think about it, uh, people wonder, why why the uproar? And it was a massive uproar leading in the Council of Ephesus, which uh, people may be wondering. Um, we're talking, and people may wonder, why, why not talk about Constantinople? Well, we're talking about Christological Council, today dealing with Ephesus. We talked about Nicaea, and leading up to Ephesus, we know that at Nicaea, the prime mover and one of the great defenders of orthodoxy was the great Saint Athanasius of Alexandria. Well, we, co we come up towards Ephesus, and we have the master of Christology, the great Saint Cyril of Alexandria. And part of his great defense was pointing to transubstantiation, to note hmm. that, look, Nestorius is denying all of these key aspects of Christology. And Gary, really, it really happens when people begin to attack the heart and the core tenets of the faith that you have great defenders of orthodoxy that stand up for the truth, and that has got to be applauded. We've had some great, fiery defenders throughout church history, and we have to say amen and praise God for that. And realize also that unlike many other figures, uh, we'll, we'll see later on in, in the show, unlike many other figures— Nestorius does return to orthodoxy before the end of his life, but Arius from the Council of Nicaea unfortunately remained obstinate to the very end. Mm, yeah, yeah. Thanks be to God for these great figures. And uh, yeah, that's awesome that he repented. Um, uh, unfortunately, Arius didn't, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, so, uh, you know, maybe if you could, uh, can you connect the dots like, what exactly was it about Nestorianism that led him to deny the real presence? Yeah, and it really was a, a very, very unfortunate thing because Nestorius did not like the title del Tocos, which means God, meant God-bearer, means God-bearer. Oh, okay. He wanted Mary to be called Christotokos, Christotokos, which means Christ-bearer. The problem is this. He wanted, and he did affirm that Christ had a fully human nature, and he was really uh, mixing back and forth and having issues with, um, with affirming the fact that Christ had a fully human and a fully divine nature. He wanted to affirm the reality of the deity, and, and he said that he, he his writing seemed to indicate that he wanted to. But the problem really was that he, everything in his language suggested that Mary gave birth to Christ, but he really was seemingly dividing up the natures. And it really was internally inconsistent with the writings of Scripture because we know our Lord Christ had two distinct natures, a human and a divine one. But Nestorius' teachings really were back and forth with lacking clarity. That is why St. Cyril of Alexandria responded so strongly. And eventually all of the dialogue and all of the controversy, hey, it led to a major council. That council of Ephesus, which was convened by Theodosius II, Convened in, convened in 431. But again, Gary, as you know, much controversy uh, from this council. And indeed, it really did receive a lot of backlash 
from the Orthodox, tiny old bishops, and Gary, rightly so, because when you attack the identity of who Christ is, you're going to get these great church fathers standing up and defending the truth of the faith. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So uh, Ephesus reaffirms Mary as Mother of God, Theotokos. Yes. Um, did they touch at all on the Eucharist in that council? They did. And you, you'll, you'll read the act to how they do touch upon the Eucharist. Interestingly enough, even Nicaea touches upon the Eucharist, which is very interesting. And you have, in his letter to the council, such a magnificent and wonderful defense of Holy Mary coming from St. Cyril. And what does Ephesus, in essence, do? Now, we'll break down uh, much more of the issues and the story as why it was wrong biblically and through the church fathers. But what Ephesus does is it confirms for us the hypostatic union of Christ. And this is the important thing, Gary, because in the previous show, what did we break down? We broke down the importance of the Nicene Creed. And Gary, I've got to be very clear. The hypostatic union was very clear in the Nicene Creed. So this begins to get denied by Nestorius. Well, it was clearly going against previous church councils and the four early fathers. The fathers were right to be up in arms in an uproar over this. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, very good. Now, real quick, if you could, def- uh, if you could define for our audience, what do you mean when you say the hypostatic union? Great. Yes, that's a great question. When we mean the perfect union of Christ, His divine, His human nature, we mean that it is perfectly united. There is no confusion of the hi- of, of the divine nature or of the human nature. It is a perfect union. There is no complication or confusion there, and. Uh, Gary, as you know very well, in the story, there was confusion there because he did. He was denying, saying, well, look, uh, you know, as far as the natures go, we'll call Mary uh, the Christ bearer. You know, denying that she gave birth to God, well, it's got to be very clear. Mary gave birth to the God man. She gave birth to a person, not to a nature or not to a, a will alone. That is particularly why uh, St. Cyril, and not only him, but many others within the church, stood up against this clear, problematic teaching the story is putting forth. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Yeah, that, that's important to remember. Uh, you give birth to a person, not a nature. You don't you don't pick up a baby and say, oh, what a beautiful human nature, right? <laughs> you, say, you say, you know, a baby so-and-so. You have a, it has a name because it's a person, right? Yes, no, no, no doubt. And, you know, Gary, it really is uh, very, very odd because Nestorius, he, he received a very high education this heresy is unfortunate we'll talk more about it on the other side of the break yeah very good we're chatting with william albrecht of patristicpillars.com and we're diving into christology more to come right after this stay tuned Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. According to Pope St. John XXIII, it is not true that some human beings are by nature superior and others inferior. All human beings are equal in their natural dignity. May God help us to look upon everyone as a person created in his image and likeness and treat everyone the same without favoritism or prejudice. This is a catechetical minute from Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Jesus does not reveal the Holy Spirit fully until he himself has been glorified through his death and resurrection. Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 728. God has put humanity on a need-to-know basis. Although God is eternally triune, he waited until the fullness of time to reveal his Son, and only in these last days, revealed and sent the Holy Spirit to be our helper. Holy Spirit, fill us with the love of God, and make us worthy servants of his Son, Jesus. This has been a Catechetical Minute, from Virgin Most Powerful Radio.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. Hands-On Apologetics. We are chatting with a good friend, Master Apologist William Albrecht, diving into Christology. And uh, you were mentioning right before the break uh, this uh, heretic named Nestorius, who denied that uh, Jesus was a divine person, that he was very highly educated. And yet, you know, he went off the rails on this. Yeah, Gary, really very interesting. His education was a a, a very high one, and he was very highly regarded, which really shows you that, uh, you know, he was indeed he was archbishop. So, I mean, that tells you a lot. You you um, you reach that particular level. Your education is, is a high one. And he was educated at a very famous theological school. The biblical one of Antioch, and uh, you know, if you look in history, you know, one name does escape me, but one does come to mind immediately. The great, uh, the golden mouth one, um, came from that school, Saint John Chrysostom. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it really is shocking because his education was one of a very high level, and you clearly see that he's departing not only from Scripture but from the teaching of the early fathers on many issues. Now, here's the other one, Gary. That, you know, I, I like. Uh, bringing out things for the audience, but I don't want to leave them on pins and needles. I want to read to them exactly what Nestorius said when it came to his denial of the real presence. He says, uh, he says, he, talking about Christ, says of the bread, it is my body. He says not that the bread is not bread and that his body is not a body, but he has said demonstrably bread and body, which is in the substance, usia. But we are persuaded that the bread is bread in nature and in substance. You know, this is pretty shocking. And then because really, in in essence, for Nestorius, there is no transmutation that takes place in the Eucharist. Um, And that is a big problem because he stands in direct opposition to the fathers before him that taught a substantial change of bread and wine that was taught by St. Cyril, St. Ambrose, St. Justin the Martyr, and all of the early fathers and clearly talked about in the Bible as well, Gary, as you can tell, uh, a number of Christological errors there. You can tell right immediately. And um, it, it truly is unfortunate. It shows you that even brilliant minds can go astray, which is why we must always pray and remain within the faith and follow the teachings of Holy Mother Church. Because no matter how brilliant you are, I think the church that Jesus established uh, has a little bit of an upper leg on your on your uh, intellect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's the brightest that uh, that more easily go to stray. You know, with our work on the Apocrypha Apocalypse, William. Yeah. The the great Jerome, you know, the the oh, greatest yeah. biblical scholar in antiquity, gets it wrong on the, something as basic as the canon of Scripture. Yeah, no doubt. And and blunders indeed. He made blunders indeed. And you would think, uh, let, let's be very clear, at the end of the day, um, Augustine, a brilliant mind, a magnificent early father. But if we get to the nitty gritty, you know, Jerome was a master of the languages, a far more adept than the great St. Augustine. But St. Augustine was, was on a better track when it came to the biblical canon than St. Jerome. So that really does say a lot, because what did Augustine do? He stuck to the teachings of Holy Mother Church, which is what we have always got to do. And what the great St. Cyril of Alexandria did, what Nestorius did not do. And it, really, interestingly enough, he kept denying, he kept saying that uh, the qualities that are of the infinite and impassable person of the Lagos uh, you know, these just didn't fit in with um, certain attributes that were given to being given to Christ by the Catholic Church. That really was problematic because when he begins to attack that, it really does go against Scripture. John 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, the Word became flesh. The Word was flesh. Now, there was another gentleman, another figure that uh, whose teaching 
was also condemned, who was expressing heretical teachings. And Jerry, you know, just interestingly enough, Theodore of Mopsuestia, who his exact words were, and I'm going to read them, it says, it is foolish to say that God was born of a virgin. Now, Nestorius and Theodore both had their teachings condemned. Interestingly enough, following after Nestorius, Theodore also denies the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Now, later on, he very clearly seems to um, do a reversal on that. In fact, uh, a big tip of the hat to Father Coppice, who I was under the impression that Theodore of Mopsuestia held to that uh, the rest of his life, and apparently there are writings that seem to indicate that he backtracked on that. So we've got to give a, a, a hearty amen to any kind of backtracking and any kind of uh, realization of, you know what, this is what the church has always taught. And no matter what kind of an intellect you have, you may have the highest of intellect, a thorough knowledge of the scriptures as laid down by Holy Mother Church is required to truly understand some of the most difficult teachings of the church. And in a bit, we will look at particular scriptures that clearly show our Lord had a divine nature and had a human nature, one that comes to mind immediately uh, when we read of texts like only uh, uh, only the Father knows the hour, uh, not the Son nor the angels. Well, the interesting thing is you read later in Scripture, Gary, and you read even the Gospel of Mark early and later, that our Lord knows all things, searches all hearts, and our Lord is infinite in his knowledge. But when it talks about certain infirmities, if you will, or certain limitations, if you will, they very clearly are in reference to the human nature, very, very clearly. And how do we know that? Because in the very context of the text, we're told that our Lord, when he ascends, will return to the glory that he possessed with the Father when? Before the foundation of the world. So it really is important understanding all of these scriptures. And when we begin to unveil them and unwrap them, Gary, it truly does paint a very clear picture for us. The picture that it very clearly was reasonable that Pope Celestine condemned the Nestorian heresy. And he also even warned those that if they would not recant of their error, they would be excommunicated. I want to be very clear. Over and over, individual, the heresies were what was condemned. People say, well, what, what about all these excommunications? Well, people were excommunicated if they refused to recant, but there were the heresies that were condemned, and these people were given the opportunity to recant and to return to the faith of the fathers. And Gary, we have to give a uh, commend. A lot of these individuals that were in error would return to the fold of the church. Some of them, unfortunately, would remain obstinate even towards the end. Yeah, 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 very good. So uh, so is Pope Celestine, who uh, kind of uh, puts the kibosh on uh, Nestorius and Nestorianism and yeah. uh, condemns it. Yeah, yeah, interesting. It, it really is interesting because you look at Nestorius, who, as we talked about, a brilliant mind, and you, re you realize how brilliant he is. And for people that are wondering, does he return to orthodoxy, you can clearly find it in the later writing of his, the Bazaar, uh, B-A-Z-A-R, uh, where it clearly does indicate that he uh, recognizes his errors. Uh, he's no longer espousing the heresy that he became famous for, which really is unfortunate, Gary, because today, today, denying Christological aspects, uh, you know, in a funny, joking kind of way, uh, you know, I might be joking with Gary and say, come on, Gary, don't be a historian. Don't deny that. Well, even though Nestorius, towards the end of his life, returned to the fold of orthodoxy, his name lives on in infamy right. for a famous Christological errors. Isn't that right, Gary? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, another thing, too, with Nestorianism is uh, it was uh, opened the door for another heresy called Pelagianism. Yeah. Because uh, since Jesus was a human person and a divine person, uh, obviously Jesus could do salvific works in his humanity. And yeah. so that kind of opens the whole idea of, uh, you know, Pelagius and and that whole problem, too. So so not only do you have Christological problems, you have Eucharistic problems. Yeah. You also have, uh, like, Pelagianism, another, another heresy. Yeah, Gary, I think you bring up a, a very, very good point there because— um, it really does fit in very clearly and make a whole lot of sense that 
with one heresy, the doors begin, you know, being thrown open for all kinds of heresies. And yeah. this opening the door for Pelagianism, and, and before you before you get this mess of a theology being put forth by Nestorius, you have the problems with an Arianism. And then semi-Arianism, and you know, and on and on. You know, it, it really I think that this is the important thing for the necessity of having authority, the necessity of having clarity. Uh, we really, really need it. And, and, you know, there is clarity, complete clarity that we find here at the Council of Ephesus. And particularly Cyril's letter that was read out loud as Epistle 4, this is what it says. The Holy Fathers do not hesitate to call the Holy Virgin Theotokos, not in the sense that the divine nature of the word took its origin from the Holy Virgin, but in the sense that he took his holy body, gifted with a rational soul from her. Yet, because the word is hypostatically united to this body, one can say that he was truly born according to the flesh. Now, Gary, that's all biblical. John 1.1. Uh, even the theology of the uh, prefigured of Christ as, as the son of man, uh, this letter is, is very clearly a letter that was laying out the orthodoxy of the fathers that uh, came before and of scripture. And as you pointed out earlier, uh, let's, as absurd as it may sound, uh, women don't give birth to natures. <laughs> they really yeah. don't. Uh, that, that, that really is, um, not only is that the height of absurdity, uh, it really is scientifically absurd, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean, uh, nature is an abstraction, right? It doesn't exist in the real world as nature. Like, you can't go to the grocery store and buy a five-pound bag of nature, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's something we kind of extract. And, and to think of, you know, to split the, the incarnation into, well, Mary gave birth to, you know, this human nature is, it, like you said, it's absurd. It really is, Gary. And here is the incredible thing. Uh, you know, you, at times uh, you get fanciful books like the one written by Dan Brown where you, you hear, well, look, you know, uh, the, you know the, the Christ as deity, you know, barely passed by a few votes. When in reality, these things are being passed unanimously. There are only those that were denying the faith that were holding on board. But for the, for the audience that may be wondering, well, how was the voting against Nestorius and against... Uh, uh, this Christological teaching. How did the voting go? How many people were behind Nestorius? To find that out, you got to hold on to this side of the break. <laughs> hey, that's a great cliffhanger there, William. We're chatting with William Albrecht at TristanPillars.com, talking about Christology. More to come right after this. Stay tuned. Here's a great way to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Do you have an old car you want to get rid of, motorcycle, RV, or boat? Simply call 855-500-7433, and when they sell that vehicle, a portion of that money comes right back to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. It's an easy way to do it. I want to thank you for it. Call 855-500-7433. God love you and your family. This message is for you. A great man once said that evil is powerless if the good are unafraid. Well, you and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. We're at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said if we lose this war, and in so doing, lose this great way of freedom of ours. History will report with the greatest astonishment that those that had the most to lose did the least to prevent it from happening. Well, I think it's high time now that we ask ourselves if we still even know the freedoms that were intended for us by our founding fathers. Every generation of Americans needs to know that freedom exists, not to do what you like, but having the right to do what you ought. You weren't made to fit in, my brothers and sisters. You are born to stand out. Set yourself apart from this corrupt generation. Be saints. God bless you.
Terry Barber here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I'm encouraging people to support realestateforlife.org. They'll have a pro-life agent for you. California's laws for the family are really bad. If you have a young family and you can afford to get out of California, get out and make a new life somewhere where you're not going to have the repressive laws. For example, if your son wants to change his sex and you don't want that to happen, the school can take your child away from you. Yes, that's how bad it is, folks. That's why I'm encouraging you to go to realestateforlife.org. God bless you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. We are chatting with William Albrecht of patristapillars.com, talking about Christology. And William, uh, you gave us a great cliffhanger uh, so I'm sure then this, the vote against Nestorius was probably razor thin, wasn't it? It was unanimously against him. <laughs> That's <laughs> an incredible thing, as you know very well, Gary. It was, um, and here's the thing too, though. Uh, his letter got a he got a um, a fair hearing. Indeed, his letter that was responding to Saint Cyril was read aloud in the assembly. And there was a unanimous reaction, that reaction that condemned it. Um, and very clearly, it was no, nothing raised within there. It was condemned unanimously. And um, very famously, we know that uh, during the evening, it was the evening of June the 22nd, uh, there were shouts from the council. We know it from those uh, outside of the council, from the faithful in the area, uh, that were shouting, praise be the Theotokos, and long live Cyril. Saint Cyril became synonymous with magnificent Christology. That is why today we point to him for a uh, crystallized, crystallized Eucharistic theology and Christology, but not only him, as we're going to find out uh, in another show we do later, Chalcedon, the great Pope Saint Leo the Great, these two giants were just massively important in understanding proper Christology, Gary. And the, the beautiful thing is the letters of Cyril and the reading there at the Council of Ephesus all had to do with scriptural readings. And the audience may be wondering, you know, William, you know, you, you talked a lot about Old Testament Christology. Do they ever bring that up later on? And they do. Look at what is read at the Council. And we read, we do not say that the nature of the word was transformed in the flesh, nor that it was transformed into a man composed of soul and body. We do assert that the word being hypostatically united to a body informed by a rational soul in an, in an ineffable and incomprehensible way became man and was called Son of man. There you go, right there. Notice how these magnificent councils, Gary, hearken to Old Testament Christology that show us, look, this is how the Old Testament laid it out. The New Testament gospel authors recognized it this way. The Apostolic Fathers, the anti nicene Fathers, and now the councils are utilizing these terms and these teachings in the very same way I've got to say it really does seem like the way our Lord set up this teaching, living, breathing church was done in a magnificent manner, I'd have to say. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's beautiful how it all coalesces together. And uh, so they can confront people like Nestorius and say yeah. definitively, no, you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and good point there, because definitively it can be said that. And notice how it really does, you do get to the heart of it when you keep reading it. It says, thus it can be affirmed that even though he subsisted before all ages and was generated by the Father, he was also generated by a woman according to the flesh. But that does not mean that his divine nature took its origin from the Holy Virgin or that this nature needed a second birth after his birth from the Father. Indeed, it would clearly be unreasonable and foolish to say that he who existed before all ages and who is co-eternal with the Father had need of a second generation in order to exist. Rather, it means that for our sake and for our salvation, he assumed his human nature into the unity of his person and was born of a woman 
This is why it is said that he was born according to the flesh. And Gary, that's an important point because as St. Cyril said, look, we're not arguing over little tiny little terms that don't mean anything. No, rather, as the council affirms, this is for our sake and for our salvation. The very way we are saved by the saving act of what was done by the God-man on the cross really was what was at stake. And, and Gary, that is what makes up a proper understanding of Christology. And that's what also makes up properly understanding what we have there in the Eucharist. It truly is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and trying to argue for a consubstantiation or for arguing that uh, bread, part of the bread remains or the substance doesn't change, truly is a denial of everything laid out in Holy Writ. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very good, very good. So, yeah, and it also puts the focus right where it should be. That is, you know, God's mercy that he would assume our human nature for yeah. our sake, right? It wasn't done out of necessity, like Cyril says, like he required a second generation. No, he did it for us. Yeah, no doubt. He did it for us. And that really is important uh, to really hammer that home and to note how everything that we've been looking at beforehand, Christ as angel of the Lord, how is he the angel, angelos? And, and clearly you even got that here that he's, sent by the Father, but he's existed, coexisted with the Father before all ages. And who is he? His identity, he's the son of man. The counselor goes on forward and saying, uh, now then, to say that the word became flesh is the same thing as saying that he, like us, became a sharer in flesh and blood, quoting from Hebrews 2.14. He took our body for his own, and as man was born of a woman, without losing his divinity or his birth from the Father, but remaining what he was, even when he assumed flesh. And it, notice how it says, this is what the Orthodox faith, Tainiel, affirms everywhere. This is what we find in the works of the Holy Fathers. That is why they do not hesitate to call the Holy Virgin Theotokos, not in the sense that the divine nature of the Word took its origin from the Holy Virgin, but in the sense that he took his holy body gifted with a rational soul from her. Gary, I love that point that, that is made there at the council. The point that this is what the Catholic faith is taught from the beginning. And notice how it says it's taught everywhere. It is Catholic. That's a mark of apostolicity. And then it says it is also found in the writings of the Holy Fathers. Indeed, Irenaeus, St. Justin the Martyr, uh, uh, Methodius of Olympus, and on and on and on. They don't hesitate to put this teaching forth. Indeed, it's taught clearly in Scripture. A, a virgin will give birth, uh, a, and uh, the child will be called Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. Now, if the virgin is going to bear a child, we have all of that right there. A virgin, a parthenos, bearing, ticto, the Greek word ticto. Who is the virgin uh, bearing? What kind of a child? God with us. Theos. The very teaching of Mary as Theotokos, as God-bearer, is found right there in the Gospel of St. Matthew. Thus, you've got this, the, the teaching, the, the voting, if you will, if you want to use that kind of language, was unanimous at Ephesus. There were no um, holdouts. There was no slim margin of people saying, well, you know what, you know, we're wavering back and forth. No, it was unanimous, Gary. And, and thus, uh, we know that this is clearly the teaching, the faith of the Father. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and also, um, well, uh, another passage, of course, is the uh, uh, w the visitation of Elizabeth, where she yeah. says, how is it the mother of my Lord should come to me? Do you, do you find that also has, a, you know, is that a good, solid uh, proof text for I, I think that's a great one, Gary, because you've got, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The Greek word utilized there is kudios, but here's the incredible point. We recognize Gudias is not always used for Yahweh, but there in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, every time Gudias is used, or Gideas, depending how you want to pronounce it, every time that Greek word for Lord is used, it is referring to Almighty God, to Yahweh, every time. And there's no way anybody can argue and say, well, you know, maybe Elizabeth was wrong. 
No, Elizabeth, under the very inspiration, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with that truth that the Holy Spirit can, only the Holy Spirit can illuminate you with, says, how is it that the mother of my Lord, clearly, very clearly referring to the mother of, the mother of God. It's very clearly, she is the mother of my Lord, the mother of my God. That is a very clear teaching being laid out in the Gospel of St. Luke, Gary. So you've got there in the Gospel of St. Matthew, the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Gary, I've got, I've got to be very clear. As brilliant as Nestorius was, he was deviating from Scripture and deviating from the teaching of the early church fathers. That very clearly was the very reason why, uh, why we have this uproar by the bishops, by the priests, because it was very clearly going against the ancient Catholic apostolic faith. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's probably a good place that we should park it here, William. Um, uh, we have a, a little bit of time left, and as always, uh, you're one of the biggest, busiest guys out there when it comes to apologetics. Tell us uh, what's up. Do uh, you, you have any debates coming up or projects you're working on? Yeah, a number of debates, a lot of debates for 2023. Uh, the very next one will be in about a week and a half, I'll be debating in Spanish. And then after that, I'll be debating an, an Islamic scholar on marrying. Really thrilled for all of those. And later in the year, a German one. So just really, really thrilled. And a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff we're working on. People, people got to head over to the Apocrypha Apocalypse as well. Just a show that we recorded, we will be putting out later on in the week where I got to interview an incredible, brilliant mind, a Syriac Orthodox deacon, Daniel Kakish. We were able to sit down, we are able to talk about the canon. So if you're wondering, well, hey, what do our Syriac Christian brothers and sisters think about the Deuterocanon? Do they view it as sacred scripture? Is it held to a lower status? You know, how do our other apostolic brothers view the Deuterocanon? A show that has never been done before. A Catholic and an Oriental Orthodox will sit down and talk about the canon. So, guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't, if you aren't sub to the Apocrypha Apocalypse yet, you're going to want to head over there and do that because we had a great time filming that, all for your edification. Yeah, very good. And uh, also, anything in the work as far as books? I know you, you and yeah. Apis has been uh, doing a lot of research. Yeah, definitely. People keep an eye out for a purgatory book and keep an eye out for another volume on Mariology. Everybody, and, and everybody, you got to pray. Keep praying for me. Pray for Gary and his incredible ministry. And I will be back very soon. We're not done with Christology yet. We're going to talk about Chalcedon and Pope Leo the Great as well. Yeah, another uh, very important and, and also controversial uh, council in church history. Yeah. So. Good stuff, William, as always. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Look forward to being back. All right, William Albrecht. Check it out, folks. PatristicPillars.com. You can see all the great stuff that he's doing. And, oh, man, the hour's gone already. Coming up next, High Impact Catholic Talk coming at you. It's a Terry and Jesse show. Thank you so much for listening, and God willing, we'll be back again tomorrow to do this thing we call Hands-On Apologetics. Bye-bye, everyone. Have a great day. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County.